Yes, welcome to the Biz Communication Show. I'm your host, Bill Lampton, bringing you every week, bringing us an outstanding communication professional whose advice will help us in our business and professional life. Today, I welcome to the show for the third time, Don Eccles. Don is a licensed professional counselor, life coach, clinical psychotherapist. She's the owner and executive director of Dawning Phoenix. On her previous two occasions with us, she has shared terrific advice, and I know that will be the case this time. Don Eccles, hello, and welcome to the Biz Communication Show. Good afternoon, Bill. It's so nice to be here again. Great to have you with us. And the topic that we're going to be talking about today will be of vast interest to many people. And that is, how do we successfully handle tension in the workplace? And so I began, Don, by mentioning, first of all, that this is not a topic that I'm unfamiliar with because I had 20 years in management before I became a consultant. And there were a lot of days that were packed with tension. And it doesn't matter whether you're being managed or whether you're managing tension is going to exist. So I'm delighted you're going to help us with this topic. And the first question I want to ask is, what do t clients tell you? How often do they tell you that their work is difficult because of the immense tension that they're facing in the workplace? That can happen frequently, um, Bill. And when it really it's not so even much a question of frequency as it is severity. Um, when people experience tension in the workplace, it does impact performance. When they come in for therapy, especially if it's been related to work, then you're, you're already looking at impacted performance because that is a distraction in a sense from the task at hand. Um, they're struggling to understand what they can do about it. And if they're the kind of uh, employee or um, contractor or whatever their role is at that organization that wants to solve problems, they may be doubly impacted by someone who is not cooperating with them. And that can really impact a good employee's performance. Well, I, I was thinking before we uh, came on the air, I was thinking about what some of the, the causes and the symptoms are of tension in the workplace I would expect that one of the greatest causes of tension people have today is the uncertainty about their job and sometimes even their profession with all the changes that are taking place in industry and business. Uh, who is certain that they're going to have a job tomorrow? So even if they like their job, even if it's what they chose to do, prepared to do, enjoy doing, want to keep doing, that uncertainty about tomorrow uh, and whether you're going to get that next paycheck and whether you're going to wait get that eventual retirement plan that you've been looking forward to, that's a big part of it, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And when a person feels that that tension is impacting their performance, they immediately then go to the question of uncertainty. And especially if they're concerned and they're facing something they can't resolve, then they say, is this going to look badly on me? Is this going to reflect on my performance? Am I going to be judged by my inability to resolve this conflict? How much of this conflict is mine? And how much can I persuade the other person to join me in a solution? And I say person because it's usually two people. Um, although it can be groups of people, in our, but we want to work more with the individuals at a certain level um, and where we kind of have to find the source of the conflict, for lack of a better term. Well, one of the things I've enjoyed uh, over the last few years is looking at places which seem like they would be fun to work, where there would be uh, minimal tension. I know, for example, that in my travels, I visited the Pike Place Fish Market in Seattle, 
where the, the this became um, sort of a cult classic because the you, when you go there, the people behind the counter are throwing fish <laughs> to each other. Uh, there's a there's a very light-hearted atmosphere. There was a book about the place. It's well known. And another place I hear is a lot of fun to work is is Google headquarters. That there, it, it's a sort of a game-like atmosphere. Uh, do you see this as a helpful trend that maybe some of the more stodgy and and established businesses could could emulate? I think that those workplaces do definitely intrigue a lot of companies and they can be what we might call trendsetters in the new workforce in a sense. Um, the other one that I thought of when you were saying those, cause I was nodding, I'm like, I've heard, even though I haven't been to the fish market, I've heard of it because of the work culture. Um, Google definitely is well known for that. I think some of the um, other Silicon Valley uh, locations are kind of follow that trend, even if they're not as big as Google and Starbucks has had that reputation. And definitely I was more familiar with that in the past, I think where they love being there. Uh, and it's quite an interesting phenomenon because sometimes, like in the case with Starbucks, for instance, a barista is not considered one of your higher paying jobs. But yet people love the work culture enough to sacrifice on some of the paycheck size in exchange for, for the fact that it's gainful employment that pays a, a wage for what they're doing in an environment that they enjoy working in. So to foster that kind of... Um, Fun, I think some, some industries may face a little more difficulty creating fun. We might have to do what we call in therapy that reality adjustment that has, says, hey, life is not always easy. Certainly the Buddhist philosophy says suffering is a part of life. We have to learn to embrace it. Freud talked about that some of our biggest neuroses come from an avoidance of pain and a seeking of pleasure. And one of the ways our egos mature is to understand that we can't always avoid pain and we can't always feel pleasure. But we certainly, I think that's the thing that fun workplaces do is it cultivates this sense of pleasure on the job and having fun at hard work. Adler talked about that work is one of our most important life tasks. It creates a sense of competency. It uh, meets the, what he uh, theorized as the idea that we strive for things. And so work was one of the three most important tasks that Alfred Adler talked about. It's the reason I enjoy being on your business communication show because work is literally one third of our 24 hours every day, if not more. So the idea that we could have fun, even when we're working hard, does come from a cohesive team, a clarified, clearly communicated vision, and to know that they're safe on the job, at least as long as they're able to produce and do what they're supposed to do. You reminded me in this part of the conversation of an incident I had in my career where I was uh, new in an organization. I had moved myself and my family several states away to work with a different organization. And of course, in the interview process, as you and I know, everybody is on their best behavior and sometimes even their jovial and formal behavior. So you don't get the total picture necessarily of what they're like. I can, I will never forget uh, what happened about the third week in the office, there were a couple of people who were having a conversation and they were laughing, chuckling. Uh, they, they were very hard workers. I'd noticed that already in the first two or three weeks. Yet the manager came out and gave them uh, truly a scowl. And he came over and said to me, you know, Bill, when people are laughing, they're not working. <laughs> and uh, I'll have to tell you, Dawn, that I polished my resume the next day <laughs> because I knew that was not the atmosphere for me. Uh, probably in uh, several decades ago, that would have been an acceptable, even expected, and even a commendable work approach that we, we are absolutely serious every second we are here. And yet it's, uh, it's very much, I suppose, uh, I don't know if it's, it's an accurate analysis, but it, it seems to me that um, it could be very much like a runner. You can't run at full speed all the time. You got to stop and take your breath. And so in the workplace, if we can get, I mean, even Shakespeare and his most 
severe, intense tragedies had comic relief. That was a part of it. So comic relief, laughter, uh, a good coffee break, uh, a walk outside the building, those things can refresh us, can't they? Absolutely. And I think for if you can cultivate a culture in your organization, I think the, the conflict, addressing conflict starts with leaders. Um, leaders have to have a clear idea of what it is they're going to do. And if I think about over the years, um, I'm, the number of times that I've seen good teams work versus teams that fell apart, um, it started with good leaders and a clearly defined set of expectations. And when leaders change the expectations, kind of like what happened with your manager where they came out, nobody's working, if they're laughing, instead of cultivating a culture of teamwork, um, that you, it's a sure sign that something's going to go sideways. And yes, you're right. In previous generations, um, that maybe a more serious work ethic was called for, but I can't help but think about the kind of old cliche that if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And there's some, there's so much truth to that. Even if we do have to work hard or get through, it's not, all, you know, there is no perfect job. It's whether or not this job is the right job for us at the right time. And is it meeting the needs that we have, whether they're, and people are not going to work for just financial gain. It, it's just not going to happen. So when we talk about conflict, I think that starts with strong leaders who have a clear idea of what they expect and they communicate those expectations. And when tension or, conflict starts, especially if it's starting in one place and it appears as though that's not being able to successfully be navigated by the employees, a leader's got to step in and communicate what they expect. And that requires some delicacy and balance that says, let me identify what's really going on and let me have a clear idea of what the protocol might be in this situation. What is it my values as a leader are? What is it I expect? I think about my first sales manager who I considered to be a gifted sales manager in many ways. He was really good at letting you know that he expected for there to be um, teamwork. He expected for there to be, um, uh, I apologize, there's some stuff going on in the background while I was trying to keep things quiet. Um, and so he expected that we would all be united around a common goal that it would be the idea that there were a couple of clear principles that he expected us to do and that we would sell from a place of strength and that we would have each other's backs in the sense that we would not cover up for things that were what he considered to be wrong principles, whether it was lying to customers, which he absolutely would not tolerate, or whether it was cheating the company, which he made clear he would not tolerate. But around that, he was like, let's all work together. So his were very clear. And then when I think about other leaders, it was um, a sense of clear expectations. They didn't change the rules on you and they would lead by example. There was one leader I had later in my career who her employees would, have, would literally have followed her off a cliff because she was going to go first. And she would have your back in, in the case if someone else in the organization made an accusation that you had failed in the job or you had not done something you were supposed to do. She assumed first that you probably had done it and it was a matter of figuring it out. And if you hadn't, it was a mistake that could be corrected. There's one point that you've made I want to underscore, Don, and that is even though we, we want some hilarity and some comic relief at work, yes, we do still have a job to do. And it's if you're looking for our total fun, well, go be a comedian someplace. Uh, we, and there's one point that I've, I've made before. I say, we don't call it P-L-A-Y. We call it W-O-R-K. So in spite of our saying, yes, we need frivolity in the workplace, we must be committed to that serious tone. Going back to your saying it starts with the leader, it is a cliche, but it does all start at the top. It reminded me of an example of how even in a very serious situation, you can bring some type of, of uh, light moment into it. Going into a budget meeting, there were about 25 of us, each of us heading a department. The CEO came in. He knew that all of us were uptight about what was going to happen to our budgets. Would they be cut? Would they even be eliminated? So I'll never forget what he did without saying a word. He passed around the table to each one of us a crying towel. 
<laughs> and so <laughs> that was saying, all right, folks, this is, yes, this is life and death to you, but come on, let's, let's, uh, let's face it and, and put it in perspective. Another point here, Don, we're saying that the workplace itself needs these lighter moments. I've been reading, as you have over the last few years, that there are a good number of employees and possibly even at higher levels who don't take vacations anymore. They're so insecure about their job. They're afraid if they leave, the job won't be there when they come back. That's not very good for a person's psyche, is it? No, not at all. There is a lot that talks about um, work-life balance. Um, it's one thing to work a lot of hours if you feel that you're uh, in charge, in a sense. Um, Self-employed people who own their own businesses and love what they're doing, they may work a lot of hours, but there's a lot of energy past and around those hours that they're weaving the rest of their life into it. You know, um, they're loving what they're doing, and they and every maybe. In, in the best working balances, even if it's a lot of hours, it's because the whole family's kind of on board with that. Whether you, you've got, you know, the 12-year-old putting labels on a mail out for somebody or not, as far as the family getting involved at work. But when people are employees, we've got to understand that they have a limited amount of control. And I think with the chaos of modern day living and the multiple modes of communication, I was thinking about this just recently with uh, some of the people on my own staff, like, we've got to have a clear idea of what method of communication we're going to use to reach each other first. Like I almost want to create sort of a, a strategy or a hierarchy of we're going to make a phone call or a text first, followed with a phone call and a voicemail, followed by an email, you know, it's like, or do I make email the form of a memo, right? So it's the idea that there, we can be hit from so many sides. And I do see that with clients who are afraid to take vacation because they're afraid of what might fall apart at work that would then reflect badly on them. And then they don't feel valued enough. There's just this sense of pervasive chaos that comes from as simple as how do we communicate with one another to what's going to happen if I go on vacation and what will that do to my life? And by staying there and working day after day after day without that vacation, they just magnify the tension. Oh, that's burnout. Even if we don't, you know, I think about the period of where we started this mandatory six day work week, uh, going back to probably the railroad period, um, because they found out that they were losing people. It wasn't because there was some great altruistic mode of we're going to be good employers. It was, oh my gosh, we're losing people. They're dying or getting maimed because we overworked them. This is hurting our profit. We better give them a day off. Hence we most have interesting, most interesting. A final comment as our time is winding down. I read just in the last day or two that there are, uh, there's a growing number of companies who are forbidding their supervisors and their employees to communicate by email or telephone after business hours or on weekends. I'm so glad you brought that up because I wanted to make sure that we did talk about screen time, that everybody's talking about parents are reading a lot about that. Parents are hearing about the limitation to screen time. I just uh, had a colleague of mine share a really valuable article from an occupational and um, what they call the occupational therapist, which my alma mater has a really flagship program, graduating a lot of qualified occupational therapists with children for their brain development by movement outside and away from screens. I think in a way, this is a good thing. I, you know, we have to create this sort of forbidding and these policies because what's happened is we've evolved into these permeable boundaries. There's no clear time you leave work because you can be reached. So I think in a way, while it might swing too far one direction, we might need that for a little while to create a place because from a standpoint of how I operate as a counselor, we look a lot at what they call mindfulness. We need that downtime. We need that space to reflect. We need time away from screens, whether it's a mobile device, a computer, a television. We need time outside. We, our bodies need to move. It's how we've evolved. Mankind and womankind has walked the face of the planet, starting barefoot for a long time. And we need that connection to the quietness, the stillness, silence to renew and refresh. We need work-life balance. Life coaching is about that. How do we find work-life balance? What are your priorities? And are the kind of things that you think you have to do? Sometimes we get, I think of it like being in the far left lane on 400 versus when I move over. And the idea that I'm just wound up 
and, and you're feeling like you got to keep putting on the gas and you get over in the right lane and you take your foot off the accelerator and you're, you take a breath and you say, I'm going to get there on time and I'll ride behind this person unless they're going 35 miles an hour, which I don't like to do on 400 because everybody's going faster. But this idea that you're going 85 in one lane and you can go 60 or whatever in the next and it's, and when you get over, you still get there. My father told me years ago when I started driving, he was one of those that'd be in the left lane. He was driving over 65 miles one way to work and he was worried about being late. My father's a wonderfully goal directed person. And he said, honey, I had this little old lady that kept passing me. And he said, I'd pass her and I'd go around cause she's too slow. And he said, I look up lo and behold, I got to work and there she is. And he said, she got there on time and she never rushed. He said, honey, you can slow down. You will get there. It's that turtle hair thing. And so we have to unplug. We have to find time. We have to breathe. And we can do that through the simple process of what's my role? What's my job description? What is my obligation? And is it going to be as bad as my brain is telling me it's going to be if I take my foot off the accelerator? Excellent insights. Excellent advice for us, which I anticipated, predicted, and promised. Don, I know that many of our viewers would like to have other conversations with you, so please give us your contact information. Be glad to. Thank you so much for asking. My office is Dawning Phoenix. It is located in Gainesville, Georgia. We have a website, www.dawningphoenix.com. My telephone number is 678-965-9591 or you can use the Contact Us tab on the website, which is a great way to ask general business questions about our services, which include life coaching. Thank you, Dawn. And now that Dawn has given her contact information, I'm happy to share mine, Biz Communication Guy. And so logically, my website is biz, B-I-Z, bizcommunicationguy.com. Invite you to go there, sign up for my online newsletter, check my services for corporations and for business leaders. Look forward to hearing from you. Thanks to all of you who joined us. And Don, thank you again for being with us and sharing such tremendous, valuable guidelines for how we handle tension in the workplace. Any closing comments or thoughts? Thank you for that opportunity, Bill. I always find the information that we share, the guests that you have, um, your podcast, blogs, um, posts, whatever way that I get access to the information that you share, of course, starting with your website, is always helpful to me as a leader as well. And I just would like to encourage everyone to kind of find that place, where is your lane, and be able to feel strong about that, hold your head up and say, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, and I'm going to stay in my lane and do it. Thank you, Don. Thanks to all of you who were with us. Look forward to having you with us again next week on the Biz Communication Show. I'm your host, Bill Lampton.